I went over on a, a British, an old British ship, Highland Brigade was the name of the ship. And I left New York Harbor and went over to England in that, in a Highland Brigade was the name of it. And we were in the Liverpool Harbor. And that's where we got off of the ship in the Liverpool, Liverpool Harbor. And I'll never forget the people in England really suffered. Nobody will ever know how much those people suffered and what they'd done without food and cigarettes and everything that they was used to having they didn't have. And I threw over, I was smoked cigarettes back in those days, and we could get more. And I threw every pack of cigarette I had overboard in England. Those people was on the dock begging for food. We threw it over all the food and everything we could give, we threw it overboard to the people. Every once in a while, a pack of cigarettes would hit the dock and bounce down to the water, and they had water placed about this big as long in the woodwork down at the bottom of the dock where the water was flowing through. A couple guys run and got a basket and a rope. And there was no more cigarettes went through that dock. They caught them. They raised they saved them out. <laughs> it was really, I felt so sorry for those people, I'll tell you, by and by. So when you witness that, some of the suffering, what sort of thoughts kind of go through your head? The reality of a war, when you saw some of the people that were suffering in England? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what started going through your mind? Well, I just, how thankful I was to be an American. Yeah. So when, he, when you land at the Liverpool Harbor, mm -hmm. Where did you guys go to next? Wales, Scotland, Scotland, Wales, went up north. And they went and stayed in, in the Girl Scout camp. The whole regiment, the whole outfit, we stayed in a Girl Scout camp up in uh, Scotland, Wales? In Wales, yeah, Wales, I believe it was. Yeah. yeah. So, how long were you in England before they uh, shipped you over to Wales? Oh, probably, I'd say a month. Probably about a month, yeah. So what did they have you do in, in Liverpool? Like, was there any training? Uh, we, yeah, yeah, we took, uh, we had a march, had marches, and uh, in Northern England, yeah, we see, <laughs> we had a lot of a lot of marches to do, and on the countryside, out on gravel roads, you know, country roads, you know, yeah, yeah. Did you, did you come across any other uh, British soldiers um, or uh, what were some of the interactions, I guess, with even some of the English folks or people? Did you have much interactions with some of them? What do you think of you guys? Yeah, they, we, whenever we would be in, we'd talk and visit, you know, with each other. Yeah, they were nice people. They were all nice people. They were all good to us, every way they could be, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I liked English people. They were, they were good people. You know. I felt awful sorry for them. Well, I'll tell you, they suffered during World War II. I don't mind. When you went to Wales, um, how long were you there, and what did they have you guys do there? We was bivouacked, camped out in a in a country. Uh, there was what they call a, a miniature castle in a field, in a field all by itself. And I could remember they had farmerettes, what they called farmerettes, English girls, all dressed the same with, with uh, like bib overalls on, you know. And uh, they had a whole encampment of them across. And of course, they were off limits. There was no way that anybody went over there. But they, those farmerettes, they went out there and farmed the fields with hoes and, you know, you know uh, hoeing the crops and stuff. Those farmerettes, they called them. Yep, English girls. So, what did they did he just give you more hiking and calisthenics and stuff to stay in shape? Yep, we done forest marches, went on forest marches, and, and, and uh, had calisthenics regularly. Had a regular special place for them. I don't know if yeah, yep. And so, how how long was that time span? About another month. Uh, well, we was there. Probably a month or better, and then they moved us from there to another to another camp where there was just nothing but tents. 
we after we got there, we still we still started going to. We stood our own guard. We, they, they, they had a compound, and we would have to stand our own guard at night, you know. And what we would do, they had a village that went very far away. And what we would do, of course, we'd see guys coming towards the road, and we'd have be turned the other way, headed the other direction, you know, so we didn't see them go through the fence. <laughs> they, they, one night, my buddy and I, we went over the fence. We got a, went, to, went to a village. And uh, I'll never forget, I tore my OD pants on a barbed wire fence right next to a, uh, there was a little gas house that had a, a barbed wire fence fastened to it. And the MPs came into town, after guys. And uh, the guy running the place where we was at told us, said, boys, the MPs are coming, you better hide. And we took off down the back alley, and when I crossed the fence, I tore my pants. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> We we got away. They the P, they had the back end of the truck full of guys in. They go to, go the way back to camp. It was about a mile back to camp. <laughs> and we got back about ten o'clock that night. And there they was out on the where they done their exercises and calisthenics and stuff. There was an officer had all these guys lined up. We took them out of the trucks and made them do. Uh, oh, everything, exercises, you know. Was, then they get up and they'd have to run a while. <laughs> they were really bored of doing it. <laughs> we were sitting back there, dead opening, looking at them. <laughs> we were lucky we wasn't one of them. <laughs> I, I bet. I'm sure they probably weren't uh, in, the, in the very best shape, <laughs> no. especially having a few drinks trying to do <laughs> Yeah, yeah. All they could get, what type they had to get it in, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it was quite a deal. So you were over that encampment for um, how long? Oh, yeah, that one there? That compound that you were in, how long yeah, were you uh, in that We were in there too long, probably, I doubt it, three weeks probably at the most, yeah. And then where did you guys get sent to yeah, next? From there, we traveled on a train put us on a train somewhere there, and we went towards the channel. And when we got down, and then they, we went across the channel in, in boats, of course. So you guys were headed to the front after that? Huh? So they were getting ready to send you guys to the front after that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They had a tour we was headed for, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Merle, can you tell us where you were at when the Normandy invasion took place on June 6, 1944? Yes, sir. Uh, when the invasion took place, I was waiting to go over. And I never knew when we were going to go, but I was waiting to go over. Well, we were all prepared for it. But like I say, we could hear we could hear the big guns booming. If the wind was just right, we could hear them booming. See, it was a hundred and about a hundred and thirty mile to where that was going on. Uh, well, by the time you get across the channel, that was twenty-seven mile across the channel, and then you get inland in England where we were at. Well, it was about that far before, and we were waiting to go over. That was when the invasion took off. But there was a lot of men died that day. Okay, so you were getting ready to head over, and when you crossed the, the channel uh, to go into France, uh, where did you guys uh, land at? And then uh, what do you remember about landing where you guys did? Uh, uh, we went down a rope, a rope ladder, inside the ship, into a landing craft. And the landing craft held, we were jammed in there. We couldn't have fell down if we'd have got a shot. And it was one of them that had the, the front end come down, float down on it. And uh, we went, the guy running the boat, he done the best he could. He got us in as far as he could when we got to the, to the other shore. But he could only get in so far as he hit bottom. And he kept back and forth trying to get us in further. But I, I couldn't, 
uh, imagine what it was like uh, with all those guys bodies popping up to the top of the water, you know, uh, dead, uh, hundreds, uh, hundreds of men got killed going in there. And I couldn't imagine what what would have been like in that mess. Uh, they took big tanks, Sherman tanks, and they put uh, canvas sideboards on it, up clear above the surface. And they fixed those tanks and, and put floats on the side of them had big floats on the side to float them to get them in. And there was two, only two tanks made it to shore for protection. That's what these people had for protection, to be behind the tank. As they was going in, they was behind the tank. Out of 30, I think out of 30 sub tanks, there was only two that ever made it to the shore. The rest of them sunk. And there was eight guys, I think it was eight man crew in each tank, and they all got out but three when they sunk, yeah, yeah. So when the front gate of your landing uh, craft opened up and you guys jumped out, yeah. uh, what happened? How, how deep was the water? How was it trying to get onto the beach? Right here, chest deep, about chest deep. And did you guys land under fire at all? No, not us, no, we didn't. It was, uh, the, that was over with before we, before we landed. Yeah. So when you guys get onto the beach, what do you remember seeing? What was it like? Well, I remember it started out about 30, 40 feet of just sand and you know, a little bit of an incline, and the further it went, the steeper it got. And then there were ditches down through it. And they had, uh, it, was a, it was an awful looking mess. They had the, the the cliffs was off to the right, and we landed just to the left of where the cliffs were. And those cliffs were full of Germans, and they had rifles shooting down. And they were shooting just like shooting ducks. The guys coming in, at, you know, they had no protection because the tanks all sunk. It was supposed to come and be their protection for them, all but two. And uh, they had they had. Uh, ribbons set up that had to walk between them because they didn't get all the vines lifted on the beach. The vines were still a vine plant and they had ribbons we had to stay between them on our way in to the inland. And uh, I just trying to think what we, when we got, we made our way inland and wasn't, there wasn't anybody stepped on a mine, there wasn't anybody got on a mine on the, on the landing. We all got in okay. But, uh, We made our way up through the shore. They loaded us up on the, and, and, and by that time the invasion, they had fought their way inland, you know, quite probably 10 miles or more, I don't know how far, but far enough that when we got unloaded and got off, we went in, we went in probably two or three miles before we stayed that night overnight. And uh, we stayed overnight. And then the next morning we got up, and th they had really the Germans had had run. They took off and run, and uh, we did. We went for uh, quite a while before anybody ever fired a shot that I know of. And uh, but you could see the terrible things that happened between there and and where we was going. You know, it's a terrible. You see tanks and blowed up and blowed in two and everything. Can you describe some of the things that you remember seeing? Um, whether it's, you know, the villages or some of the crosses or some of the destruction. Um, and what what, is, what does that start to do to you when you start seeing some of the signs of, of combat and war? When we went through the first little village that we went through, it was, uh, there was a river run through the village and it had a stone bridge uh, an oval type bridge through it. And I'll never forget a young lady standing alongside the curb as we went by. And she was scars, it was some kind of a disease or what, but she was scarred from her legs just up as far as you could see. And uh, I don't know what in the world she could have had and what was wrong with her, but she was an awful looking by herself sat on the corner of that street. 
And I don't know what, where she was going or who was getting her or anything. But we went on, we went on, on by, and that's the last I ever seen her. I don't know what happened to her. But uh, that was one of the awful things. And, uh, we went quite a ways before we stopped for, for overnight that first night. Yeah. What was your reception like? Did you start to see some of the people the, the, of France? Did you have any reactions with some of the villagers? The seen, seen, uh, we seen a few, very few uh, men. After that woman, it was, it was all men that we seen. I don't know where the women were, where they went to, but, they got, but we didn't see that many, but what, was, what, what we did see were men. So when you, when you get to the front, and you get to, you know, I guess the lines before you're going to get really deployed into a position. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us a little bit about that. Well, first thing, of course, we dug in, you know, dug the holes, and uh, we was there. We was there a couple of days. I don't that. Uh, yeah. What were some of your like, I guess, like your responsibilities. Did you go on patrol much? Oh, not a whole lot, but some, you know. Yeah. What was it like going on on patrol? What, what were you supposed to accomplish when you went out on patrol? Well, it depends on what they sent you for, you know, what, what it was for. But usually on a patrol, well, you went to gather information, you know. Mm -hmm. of how many enemy and so on and so forth, if you could tell, if you could count them. That was usually the reason for it. But uh, they, had, uh, they had a lot of different reasons for patrols. But, uh, I never went on, but I guess maybe a couple of patrols and at, uh, in, on, in combat. Uh, usually when it got dark, why well, you was where you was going to be, and you better stay there. Was it pretty dangerous going on patrol? Yeah. Yeah, it was very dangerous. Very dangerous. Uh, what was the combat like, and trying to survive in, in these hedgerows? Can you kind of describe? You remember what the hedgerows looked like, and what made that uh, a dangerous combat zone for your troops? Well, the hedgerows was nothing more than mounds of dirt, about your shoulder high. And uh, uh, Normandy was, oh, it was had head row fences all the way. That's what they used for fences, and it was all the way across that country, all the, there, the head row. Yeah, it had brush row out of them, you know. And, yeah. So what was each of these head rows? Did the were the Germans uh, stationed? And entrenched in each of these hedgerow, hedgerows. How did you did you guys have to take each head each uh, hedgerow that was ahead of you? Was that was that what your, your mission? Well, you was? see, the Germans was there uh, probably four years before the invasion. You know, they occupied France. You remember? They mm -hmm. they occupied France quite a while before. Well, they had time. They built actually on the reverse side of of a lot of those hedgerows. They built what you call sod igloos. I don't know what they put in them for frame. I never got in there, went in one of them, but I've seen a lot of them. But they would come up, to hop about this high at the top of the ground, and they would come out, out and down onto the ground with the egg glue. And uh, Normandy had a lot of them. Like I say, it was that was they was there four years. They had time, and they even had the grass growing on them. You couldn't see them, but you got right on top of them. Yeah, yeah. How was the weather? The weather? Yeah. What do you recall for the weather? Well, it wasn't it wasn't near as bad for us as it was for the ones down there on the on the peninsula. They they had some terrible weather down there, I guess. I don't. I wasn't there in the winter time. I was lucky. Uh, you know, winter winter was over. And I, I was lucky. I wasn't there with a real cold winter. winter uh, guys actually froze, you know, something I like think. It was awful. Yeah. But, uh, but I missed out on that. Yeah. So what did you guys, um, what did you carry with you? Uh, and what did you eat when you guys were um, 
in your foxholes and stuff like that? <laughs> Not much. We had what they called K rations. Did you ever hear of them? About blocks about that long, about that thick. They'd have uh, four cigarettes in a package at the end, one end. Then they had uh, they had the egg. They had scrambled egg in in a, in a little round thing about this big around in one end. They had scrambled egg, and I think maybe bacon or some kind of some kind of dried meat in it. And uh, and we had K they'd get K rations up to us somehow. I don't know how, but we got that's what we had was K K rations. A little box about that wide, about that long, and then uh, yeah. So one of the things that's uh, kind of a buzzword, I guess, um, what's a German 88? It's a very unique weapon. It's a barrel, they got a barrel on them about eight feet long, and the barrel starts back at the back end about this big around, and it tapers down to something like four inches at the front. And a German 88 shell is I'd say they're about that long, yeah, at least that long. And right here at the top of it, it comes up, swells up here, and then it comes down like this. And it's got fins in the back of it. It makes it fly steady, I guess, or almost steady wherever it leaves the barrel. <clears throat> but they are a wicked, wicked weapon, I'll tell you. They'll do a lot of damage. They get, yeah. They laid, they laid that field. What they would do, they would, they would set them guns up at so far apart. Then the gun commander would call fire one, two. He would tell them three, and if each one fire each gun as he called it off, and they have them set up so they could blanket a whole stinking area. You know, that one shell would overlap another one, and they done that. The morning that we took the big shove off after the invasion, they done that, but luck as a have it, our commander pulled us ahead fast enough, quick enough, that they laid that down behind us. I mean, they just bombarded things flat back of us. If we hadn't moved forward, they'd have killed us all, probably or all of us. But he was smart enough, he knew it was coming, and he called us forward, and we just got forward in time, and they laid right behind us just later flat. The shells, and that's how they done it. One, two, three, you know, and the whole blanket, the whole area. You know. When all that's going on, like what goes through your mind, like when you're being shelled like that? I mean, what did you guys do? Like, how does that affect your psyche, your thinking? Well, like I say, the only thing you think about, just wonder how soon it's going to be me, you know. Just wonder how soon it's going to be my turn to get her. Yeah. Did they fire the 88s at you guys a lot? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was their main weapon that was in, in France, in Normandy, was the 88s. Yeah, they used them a lot. They sure did. Well, all, we, we was under fire, actually, all the time after I got up to uh, St. Lo. We was under fire about continually. Uh, so much so that you just, you know how you escaped it, you know how you how you come out alive, really. But, uh, but we did. A lot of us did. A lot of us died too. But uh, talking about there where I got my foot blowed off uh, that, that day, I was running as hard as I could run from a machine gun. And of course, by running so fast, I got the right leg ahead fast enough that they caught the blast and it blew the whole back of the right leg off. Blew, blew, the, out, blew it out, the whole back of it, from the ankle to the knee. But that was what happened there was, I was running so fast from a machine gun that I stepped on the mine and, and that's, what, that's what caused that. You, you can't, it's hard to believe it. The mine blew the foot off, but yeah, it blew the back out of this leg, you know. But I done it by getting this leg, by running real fast, getting this leg ahead, I got out the blast. That's what happened there. <clears throat> and so, you had come under the fire 
from a sniper. Yeah. And so when that happened, or can you tell us a little bit about how that happened? What were you doing when a sniper uh, shot at you and even hit you? Can you tell us about that part? Oh, I'm going to think. When I got this. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I had come up the hill from that little village down down there in the hollow, and I had come up the hill from that, and I was crossing the road to get on the bank. The lieutenant was with me. Yeah, right, right out in the middle of that road when I was crossing, there was a, a bullet that went by my ear just so close, and when I got across the road, I rode on across the road, and then Lieutenant had got, he was set to straddle the hedgerow to get over it, get over it. And I hit him and knocked him clear off the hedgerow right over on the ground, and I let right on top of him. <laughs> and he said, what in the hedgerow are you? I said, well, a sniper bullet just about nicked my earlobe down there in the middle of that road. And I said, I was in a hurry to get under cover. Oh, he said, I don't blame you. <laughs> yeah, that was that was a, the closest. I, I really felt the air off of that bullet. <laughs> and so after you got hit, um, what did you, did you try to get back to the front line, or what was what was going on after you got hit? What were you trying to, to do? Were you trying oh, to get I away couldn't, from I couldn't have got nowhere. After I got hit, I couldn't have got nowhere. Well, in, in the arm. Oh, the arm. Oh, yeah. what, oh. What, what did you try to do? Uh, I took my handkerchief out of my pocket and stuffed it under my shirt cuff like this. <laughs> it, it, it wasn't bleeding real bad, just dripping a little bit. I stuffed my, my handkerchief in there. To hold it. That's all I ever done. And, and the medics never found it when they was arrested. That was just about five minutes before I got my foot blowed off. And they never seen this. And I never thought to tell him about it either. <laughs> yeah. So when you stepped on the landmine, uh, you were running from the machine gun? Mm-hmm. And so... I outrun the machine gun, but I didn't outrun the landmine. So when that, did you realize that you stepped on a mine, or did it surprise you that you, that you stepped on one? Well, I knew I stepped on a mine when it exploded under my foot, you know, I mean, I knew it. Oh, right, but when you were, did you realize that it was under your foot when it went off, or did it surprise you when it went off? Well, it surprised me, yeah, it sure did, yeah. So, I don't know if you'll be able to explain this, but, like, how much pain were you in when that went off? A lot of it, a lot of it. Probably, I would imagine as the most pain that I ever had. You know, of all the things that ever happened to me, I figure that's probably the most painful. Yeah, you know, I'm sure it was. You know. Did you think that you were going to die when that happened? I didn't think about. It. I didn't think about it one way or the other. I guess I just. I, I was still alive and thankful for it, but uh, I, 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 did, I don't think I thought, I thought about it. So, so I don't think I thought about it. Did you pray at all? Did, were you asking, you know? Oh, yeah. You're praying? Yeah. What did you pray? You was either praying or you was swearing. Now, that's the truth. Uh, any soldier will tell you, most of them, that, uh, because I, at that time, I wasn't saved, you know, but uh, I still prayed. You don't make you pray, but you're saved or not. <laughs> but uh, I didn't get saved till after I was in the hospital. Yeah. So after you stepped on the landmine, how how did help find you? Well, one of the guys that was there got got up for me. They got they, yeah, one of the guys in the squad. Got him, I think. Was it was it your was it one of your friends yeah. that got the medics out there? I'm sure it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when they came to get you, uh, do you remember what they did to help bandage you up and, and get you out of there? Yeah, they uh, 
They give me a shot, I'm pretty sure. And they, they bound it up. They poured uh, that penicillin uh, oh, powder that they use for disinfect. They poured, poured it full of powder and wrapped it up. And uh, put me on the stretcher and carried me out. So, how long were you in the hospital, and and um, when did when did your parents find out about your injury? Uh, I can't be real sure. I know the uh, the government would always send a car out with the information was officer. You know, there was two officers went out to my place to the farm to tell them about me getting injured. And uh, mom said, my dad is as rough a guy as he was, as rough a talker and, and, and anything. I never dreamed it. But she said he laid right down. When he seen his government car coming up the lane, she said he laid right down in the grass and cried like a baby. And he just knew I was dead, you know. But the officer jumped out of the car and ran over to him, you know. Mr. Jarvis, your son is still alive, and he said, you got to live. He said, you know, all right, you got to live. But I see he got quieted down. And, but I never could imagine him, the way he treated me and the rest of his kids, I never imagined him ever having them kind of feelings, but you never know. Yeah. So what, did your parents get to visit you in the hospital, um, in the stateside? No, I was I was over to, I was to states uh, oh several months before uh, before I got to come home. I I come home to see them. They didn't come to see me. Uh, so when you were some of my relation come to see me, got to see me, but uh, they didn't. So what was that like getting uh, off or getting dropped off here in, in, in Mansfield? Um, did your parents pick you up at the train depot or did you have somebody drop you off here at the house? No, uh, you mean when I got discharged? Oh uh, yeah, I guess, what, what about that? How did you get discharged? Talk to us a little bit about how you got discharged. The Halloran General Hospital in Michigan, in the Upper Peninsula in Michigan, well, you're not the upper, it's the mainland. Uh, there was a guy with me in the hospital that I knew real well related to. Some of his relations were related to some of mine. And uh, his brother, Fred, from Perrysville, they lived in Perrysville. They was going to, he was coming after him when he got discharged to take him home. So they come in and they took me too. They got me and took him both of us and dropped me off at home on the way down, on the way down. Yeah, it's the way it was. Yeah. So when you arrived at your house and your parents see you for the first time, what was that inter interaction like? Glad to be home. What, what was your mom? What was your mom uh, saying? What, what, what was your mom? Oh, mom was crying and boohoo, and she was bro completely broken hearted. <laughs> but she was glad that I got home. Mm -hmm. Yeah.